Well, I am glad that you're able to join us this week for our weekly Bible study. And tonight we're going to talk about the best question. <clears throat> um, there are lots of good and important questions that you should ask yourself in life. Uh, probably the way most people begin talking about is, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? And so people will ask kids that question, and kids will think about, what do I want to be when I grow up? Other questions are going to be, who are you going to marry when you grow up? Or you could even ask yourself the question, do I want to get married? Might be a better place to start. But um, you can ask, do I, am I going to go to college? Should I buy a house? Should I rent a house? Uh, there's a lot of questions that are good to ask and good to think about and good to talk about. And all those questions are going to impact your life um, down the road. But there's one question that is way more important and is honestly a much better question to ask. Um, and I'm going to read out of Acts chapter 9, verse number 6. And it's a simple question. It's only eight words. But this, no doubt, this is the most important question and the best question anybody could ever ask. And this is from the story of Paul. Um, he's also called Saul. In this chapter, you'll see that, but I'm just going to read the questions out of Acts 9, verse 6. And this is what it says. So he, is talking about Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So um, Saul asked the Lord a very simple question. It's eight words. Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, I'm 100% sure that this was the turning point in Saul's life. What he's basically saying is, I'm not going to keep doing what I want to do all the time. I'm not going to be the king of my life. I'm not going to be the boss of me. I'm not going to make my own decisions. What I'm going to do now is I want to do what the Lord wants me to do with my life. And the question is a really great question. It's the best question because it marks the turning point in someone's life. Where basically, I talk a lot about this, I've been talking about it on these videos um, kind of regularly, that a person is basically, when they say, Lord, what do you want me to do? They're basically turning away from a life that is marked by sin and selfishness. I, what I want, basically people say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, however many times I want to do it, as long as I want to do it. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not living for me and sin and selfishness. I'm going to follow and trust and obey the Lord. That's a different life. And that life leads to life. It leads to blessing where this is a destructive path. And Paul is a great example of that. In this verse where he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's basically beginning, uh, dramatically beginning to live a new life. And the background of the story is important. Uh, we're just, for a minute, I'll talk about Paul's life before he asked this question, before Acts 9, verse number 6. And he was an extremely anti-Christian. He was against Christianity. He was opposed to Christianity. He did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he was also sinful. He talks about it later on that he, he, was the, that he even calls himself the chief of sinners. And so he felt like he was really not on the right path at all. And I'm just going to go over in Acts 26, Paul actually talks about his life right before, before he gets to this point where he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? This is the way he was living. And I'm reading out of Acts 26, verse number 9. He says this, Indeed, I myself thought I must do, um, I, I, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. What Paul is saying is, look, before, this, this is the story of Paul, before he became a follower of Christ, he was basically a bounty hunter. He was Saul the bounty hunter. He was hunting Christians. He was going to foreign cities. He was leaving the nation of Israel to go to foreign cities to try to find anybody who was a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was 
He was um, already having Christians arrested. He was putting them in prison. He was casting his vote to put them to death. He was enraged. He could not stand the people who professed to be believers and followers of Christ. So he was extremely anti-Christian. You could say he was going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. And I thought about all this. If you think of the, the, th think of the person you know who would be the least likely to become a Christian, Whoever you know, that would be, that's, uh, that, I don't know if that would be a good senior, senior superlative or not. Least likely to become a Christian. But everybody knows somebody who you would say is, Paul would have been that guy. Least likely to become a Christian. There's no way this guy is going to become a believer and follower of Jesus. But that's exactly what happened to him. And the good news is, the Bible talks about Paul is a pattern of, of people who God does choose who do become believers and followers of Christ. So a lot of times the ones that we think are the least likely become the followers of Christ. And so what Paul is doing in this story in Acts chapter 9, he is on his way to Damascus hunting for Christians so he can put them either in chains and imprison them or so he can actually see that they're executed. And while he's on his way, a miracle occurs. This is, not, this is a true miracle. We talk about miracles. Sometimes we say Georgia Tech winning the football game is a miracle. And that's a, that's a, that, I understand what you mean when you say that, but that's not actually a miracle, okay? This is a miracle what happens. I'm going to read what happens to him. And this is all leading up to the question that he asks. So Acts 26, I'm going to read verse number 12. Paul says, While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, Along the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And so what happens is at noontime, Paul is getting close to Damascus where he's going to hunt for Christians. There is an a, 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 a exceedingly bright light, a blindingly bright light that shines on the Saul and the people who are traveling with him. It's brighter than the sun. And a voice speaks directly to Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Um, so just some quick points about what happened here. First thing is, this is not a normal story. Um, this is not something that happens every day. Today is uh, May 27th, 2020. This did not happen to anybody today. I highly doubt this happened. Where the Lord, a bright, uh, blindingly bright light appears, shines on somebody, God speaks directly to them in the Hebrew language. And Paul uh, admitted that. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, he talks about that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me last of all, as the, the last apostle to, uh, to directly encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is not something that normally happens. God's not going to appear and shine a bright light on you and speak to you in the Hebrew language. You cannot wait on that to happen. But there are some things we can learn about this. This is the first thing I would say. God intervened directly in Saul's life to get his attention in a dramatic way. He knocked him to the ground. That's what it says in verse 14. They had fallen to the ground. Um, he stopped him dead in his tracks. And you know, I thought about it today. A lot of people don't look up until they're knocked down. We know that. Um, uh, a lot of times when you get knocked down, the only place you can look is up. And so uh, the Lord gets Saul's attention in a very dramatic way. And no doubt he still does that today in different ways, whether it's through health, through financial crisis, through a pandemic. Um, there's different ways God can get somebody's attention. And here's the thing. He had to get his attention because he was occupied. It says that, I, I, I thought about this in verse number 12. Paul says, while thus occupied. What was Paul occupied with? What was, he, um, what was he busy with? What was he obsessed with? What was he consumed with? Well, he had one thing on his mind, finding Christians and getting them put in prison or getting them executed. That, that, that was his focus. And a lot of people are very occupied with things. That's one benefit of the pandemic. People are not as occupied. So people are occupied with their job, their career. They're occupied with finances, occupied with sports, occupied with school, occupied with travel or, or, or social media, whatever. They're just spending all their time on that. And, and what, what happens, when that happens, and this is just what happens in everybody's life, it's not a good thing, but... Um, 
you never really stop and think about, am I, am I on the right path? Am I living my life well? Am I doing the things I... I and so um, he was occupied, and so God had to get his attention. But I will give Paul some credit about this. He was open-minded. When the Lord spoke to him, Paul, this is what Paul said, Who are you, Lord? Now, if you know anything about Paul or Saul, he was a highly educated Jew, okay? And so um, he, he was supposed to know who the Lord was, the right answer for him would have been Yahweh or you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Paul realizes there's a chance that I don't really know what I'm talking about. The Bible says in Proverbs 26, 12, you see a man who's wise in his own eyes, there's more hope for a fool than for him. So uh, Paul, at least he was willing to ask the question, who are you, Lord? And I was thinking about that. It is crucial to be um, open to rethinking the direction of our life sometimes. See, that's what he's willing to do. He's willing to say, okay, and sometimes we have to think, maybe I'm totally wrong here. Or maybe I'm not as good a person as I think I am. Or maybe I need to totally change the purpose of my life, totally change my beliefs, and totally change my actions. Or maybe what I'm doing is not okay. So Saul is willing to say, who are you, Lord? And then this is what happened. The Lord clearly revealed himself to Paul. This is what he said. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. And so what, what, that's just the Lord making it abundantly clear to Saul. I am the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I am. And again, the Lord is not going to speak to us on, our, on a trip to Damascus. But God does reveal himself clearly to us. And this is how he does it. He does it a lot of different ways, but some, he does it through his creation. The um, Bible talks about the, 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 the attributes, the, the truthfulness of God can be seen in what's made. He does it through his word. If you were to take the Bible and read it and, and you understand more about God, more about Christ, more about the, the truthfulness of Christianity, the Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. He does it through other people through, who witness to us, who testify, who talk about the difference the Lord made in their life. And, 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 and he does it through the Holy Spirit who convicts us and corrects us. And so God, God clearly reveals stuff. This is what bottom line will happen. It becomes crystal clear that Christianity is the right path. There's no doubt about it. That's what happens to Saul on the road to Damascus. He's thinking that I, I, he's living his life not a, not a believer and follower of Christ, but on this path, it becomes crystal clear to him. The right way is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, he had previously been convicted about that, and he had been resisting that. That's what it means when it says it's hard for you to kick against the goats. He had been uh, uh, resisting the truth and pushing it away and, put, and ignoring it. But now he reaches a point where it is crystal clear to him, I'm on the wrong path, and I need to get on a different path. I, and, and so he's willing, to, and that leads to the turning point, which is the question, Lord, what do you want me to do? He's, he's, he, he, he comes to the, the, that's the bottom line. That is the, the turning point for him. And really what it is, he gives up. Lord, what do you want me to do? I surrender. I will be your servant. You will be my king. I will be, you will be my master. Um, and so that, that's what happens with that one simple question. Lord, what do you want me to do? And in the question, I can see two things. First thing is, Paul has become a believer. That's why back to Acts 9, when he asked the question, what it says is, so he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? See, right now he believes that Jesus is Lord. It's become apparent to him. He's trembling. He's astonished. It, the, the, the truthfulness of really what we would now say is the Bible, the truthfulness of the Bible hits him like a ton of bricks. And he's scared to death. He's terrified. And he is shocked that this is real. This is not just a Bible story. It's not just vacation Bible school. This is not just... No way in the ark. This is true. And he is convinced by that. And not only does he know that Jesus is the Savior, he knows this. I'm on the wrong path. I'm not living like I should be. I'm, I, I am 100% wrong. Thank God he's willing to admit that and come to that conclusion. So he believes. And that leads into, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of direction. It's what we would call repenting. And there's lots of verses that I like that summarize this. Um, where, when a person just comes down and they just say, okay, Lord. And 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, one man died for all of us. Therefore, those of us who live 
should no longer live for ourself, but for the one who died for us and rose again. So he's reaching that point. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm going to live for Jesus. That's what he's saying. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm yours. You, you. Um, another passage. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned our own way. That means that we set out just doing whatever we want to do, being the boss of our life. We've all done that. Just saying, I'm going to, I'm going to make my own decisions here and do, live life the way I want to. But this is the difference. This is out of 1 Peter 2, 25. For you are like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So you're like a sheep going astray. Sheep says, I'm not going to listen to the shepherd. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going where I want to go. I'm going to go find me something. I, I'm going to be the boss here. But no, what you do is you return to the shepherd. And you say, the Lord is my shepherd. Lord, what do you want me to do? It's a surrender. It's, it's, that's changing your heart, changing your mind. Um, and that's exactly why this is the best question. It marks a turning point where a person really um, is um, giving ownership of their life. People might say like this sometimes, I'm giving my life to the Lord. Well, that's kind of what Paul's doing. God already is the owner of our life, and he bought us with a price when he died for us on the cross. But it's now us giving that ownership to the Lord. And so um, it's, a huge, it's a huge question. Lord, what do you want me to do? And I thought about it just briefly before we uh, conclude here. What, what is the answer to that question? What did the Lord want Paul to do? What does the Lord want, want you to do? What does the Lord want everybody in the world to do? And there are some things that are true for every person. I just thought I'd read a few verses out of the book of Acts. That uh, Acts 2.38, this is what it says. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants everybody to do. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift. That's God's will. That's exactly, that's the starting point right there. Um, Acts 20.21. I've already basically alluded to this. Acts 20 21, Paul says this, uh, I have testified to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God wants everybody to do. Put your faith in Christ and exercise repentance toward God. That you say, God, I'm sorry. God, I've been wrong. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's the, that's the response that the Lord's looking for. This is what Paul actually did after he said that. Um, this is what it, the, the, the first Christian he meets after he says that is Ananias. And this is Acts 2, 22, 16. It says, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So that's what the Lord wants you to do. You say, I don't know what to do. Lord, what do you want me to do? That's what it's going to be. Uh, faith in Christ, repentance towards God, be baptized, call upon the name of the Lord. And you, you can take it a step farther. Um, and I, I just I jotted this down. I was thinking about it this afternoon. What is God's will for our life? Well, Romans 6, 4 says that we should walk in newness of life. That's what the Lord wants us to do is live a new life. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, I already quoted it. says we should live for the one who died for us and rose again. I thought of one passage. If I had to just in a very uh, summary way explain to somebody what the Lord wants you to do, uh, this is out of Ephesians 4, 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what God wants you to do. You say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, we can give you some answers right here tonight. Okay, I can give you some clear answers from the Bible. Um, and what he says right there, talking about the Christian life, that you put off the old man, that you put to death the old man, the corrupt lust of your heart and of your flesh, that you crucify that, that your mind be renewed, and that you put on the new man in true righteousness and holiness. That means clean hands, a clean heart, love in your heart. Um, uh, uh, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. So you, 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 it's a total transformation of the person away from a life of sin and selfishness to a life of true righteousness and holiness. So that's what the Lord wants us to do. Then there are different answers for individuals. What God told Paul, he said, you're going to be a missionary. You're going to go preach to kings. You're going to preach to Jews. You're going to preach to non-Jews. You're going to share the gospel with people all over the globe. That's God's will for your life. And so it takes time to figure out exactly where the Lord wants you to be. But it starts with this great question, the best question you'll ever ask. Now, it's not just a matter of saying there's not eight magic words. This is a legitimate question. Lord, what do you want me to do? 
Now, I just thought of this, and I'll share this. Uh, I could ask my wife that. I have done that before, just trying to get brownie points. Is there anything I can do to help you? And a lot of times she'll say no because she knows I'll make a bigger mess if I get involved with something that she just does it herself. So it's, it's not a matter of just saying the eight magic words. This is a matter of saying, Lord, I want to live my life the way you want me to live my life. I'm on the wrong path. I haven't been on the right path. Lord, what do you want me to do? Best question, best question a person can ever ask. And so you got to get to that point. You got to get to that point where you're sincere and you're you're done with just my, me, myself, and I. That's the that is right in the middle of sin is a big I, and that's what that's what life is about until you reach the point where you realize Jesus is Lord. He died for me. He rose again. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, what do you want me to do? And I also say this and be done in a minute, one minute, sixty seconds. This is a great question to ask yourself any time. Any day, Lord, what do you want me to do? Any situation, any scenario, any evening, any morning, Lord, what do you want me to do? What you're doing in that time is you're just saying, I don't want to just spend my time and my day or my night or spend my week or spend my weekend doing whatever I want to do. We fall into that trap. I'm just doing what I want to do. No, we want to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And so it would apply to, <laughs> we know what Lord wants us to do. We have to think about it, though. He wants us to love our spouse. He wants us to serve others, to walk with him, to do what's right. He wants us to enjoy our life, to teach our kids, to be honest, to forgive people, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be tenderhearted, to seek first the kingdom of God, to be patient, not to complain. But you'll have to ask ourselves. So we can't just follow our flesh. We can't just follow the advice our buddy gives us. We can't just do what we've seen other people do and uh, just do what we want to do. We have to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's what Christianity is about. It's about me trying to do and hopefully actually successfully doing what the Lord wants me to do. I know it through his word. I know it through his spirit. There's a turning point, though, where you begin a new life by asking that question, and it's the question we need to repeatedly ask ourselves. What does the Lord want me to do? And that's how, um, that's how the Christian life is lived. So you want to know the best question? The best question you can ask is, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the answers are here. And I hope that you can remember that little question. Try to keep it simple. Eight simple words. It'll change your life and then it'll help you day by day. Um, Acts 9, verse number 6. I love you. We're praying for you. We can ever help you. You contact us. Let us know. Hope you have a good rest of the week. We are here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11. You are welcome to join us. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Thank you and have a good night and a good rest of the week.